Everybody in the room shout hallelujah. Everybody in the room shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, God is good. Now, if that neighbor didn't have a response, if that neighbor, I'm going to give you a second chance. Say, neighbor, God is good. Let me see if y'all say for real. Let me see if y'all say for real. He's good even when I'm not good. He's good when our circumstances are not good. God is good. And the Bible said because of his compassionate mercies, we have not been consumed. And so because I have not been consumed, I will not let a rock cry out for me. I will not let a rock cry out for my family. I will not let a rock cry out for my city. But Father, I thank you that I will bless the Lord. Not when the praise and worship team singing. Not at my favorite part of the sermon. Not when I get my taxes. I will bless the Lord. Look at your neighbor and scream in their face. I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praises, all his praises shall continually be in my mouth. Say, neighbor, what's in your mouth? Neighbor, your miracle is in your mouth. Your breakthrough is in your mouth. The praises are in my mouth. What's in your mouth, neighbor? I got a grill full of glory. What's in your mouth, neighbor? I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praises shall continually be in my mouth. Now, last week, the doctors thought Raven had cancer. They looked at the report and said, we feel ovarian cancer. We feel the lumps. We see it. But after seven days of praying and believing God, uh, a week later, they said, we, we, we messed up. We misdiagnosed you. I don't know what I thought I saw. Sure, what I thought I was seeing on the x-rays uh, and what I thought I was seeing on the sonogram uh, I don't know who I'm prophesying to uh, but I don't know what they thought they saw I don't know what they think they think about you uh, I don't know what they think they see about this house uh, but can I prophesy uh, that every devil is gonna have to change his diagnosis about you every devil that prophesied demonically is gonna have to change their diagnosis familiarity we ha we don't have conversations this is not just a show this is the celebration after a courtroom appearance that this church had I went to God in prayer and um, he said it, the, 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 what was happening in TG as it relates to property and land and buildings said it wasn't a credit issue. It wasn't a cash issue. Started praying and I started going deep in prayer and fasting. He said it was a courtroom issue. 
And so this was weeks ago, weeks ago. A couple of days ago, the Lord said the case was settled. I was in the courts of heaven, listen. In the courts of heaven, and he said, their case is settled. And so today is more so of God giving us instructions about the transition that's about to take place in our lives, corporately and personally. There are about to be prophetic instructions and apostolic instructions released for a transition. And I believe that God is about to change the lives, not just of the people in this church, but the people in this city. Not just the people in the city, the people in the state. And so I am so grateful to be here. I'm going to get the preliminaries out of the way. I'll get them, get them out of the way because I know Apostle is going to be ready to preach. This is a tag team. And so I want to be honorable to what I heard the Lord say. And I want to drop my portion of the prophetic word. And then I want to allow the Apostle to come up. I believe in order. And I believe in the order of God. And so as an Apostle... I, I asked him, I said, Apostle, I want you to take it on because um, that's the order of God. Amen. And so um, I want to honor God. Let's honor God for Apostle Cunningham and Prophetess Erica. Y'all, let's honor them. We celebrate them. I am so grateful that God allowed these two individuals to come into our lives at the time that they came into our lives. And I don't take it as casual that you all have asked us to come into your house on multiple occasions and entrusting us with your people, entrusting us in your territory. Um, as I was thinking about them, I believe that Apostle Cunningham is the shortest giant, one of the shortest giants that I've ever met. And I, I say that um, because Apostle Cunningham is a theologian. He is a revelator. He is a voice for this time. I, I, I say all the time, I can't wait for people to know the name of Apostle Jonathan Brown and Apostle Kenny Cunningham because I, their, their purity and their revelation, their theology is pure. It's from the secret place. It's, it's not from sermons.com. It's not something they stole from somebody else. It's a genuine poor. But when I think of this man of God, I think of a short giant. Although he's as expanded as he is in his revelation and his knowledge of who Christ is, the man of God is so humble. He's so humble. He is humble. And because he's humble, I know that God will continue to lift him up. I get to see him in private, outside of the pulpit, the same humble individual. So as great as he is, Apostle, we thank you for exemplifying humility. We thank God for that. So humble. And I admire that about Apostle. Um, we also, we honor Prophetess. Um, prophetess is, she is the loving lioness, okay? That's what prophetess is. Prophetess is the love. Don't, don't want to receive the loving and not want to receive the lioness. Because you, you need both. You need both. And she is a true prophet. When I met her, they was calling her pastor. But you can't be around a prophet long and we not find out who you really are. And I'll never forget sitting in the parking lot helping my sister pick out a venue for her wedding. And I, I, was, I was thinking like, how I'ma say it? How I'ma how I'm how I'm tell her what I already know? And so we were talking on the phone and I was like, I'm just gonna say it. I was like, your warfare is what it is because you got the name pastor, you, getting, you got the title pastor, but you got prophet warfare. And I just was, we had a conversation and she was like, I never wanted to be a prophet, none of us did. But she is a true bona fide prophet. A true bona fide prophet that God is using mightily. Amen. 
I want to get into the word, but I want to honor my husband, my man of God. He's amazing. He's kind. He's loving. He's supportive. He's a provider. Hallelujah. He's my favorite flavor. He's everything that I need and more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I got papers on them so I can say all of that. Hallelujah. But he has trained me, reared me, loved me, all the necessary things for ministry and that and beyond. I thank God for my parents. I thank God for all of you. I thank God for my children, my daughters, and Dominion City Church. I love you all. We love you all. As well as TG. We love TG. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's get into the word of God. Thank God for all of you who are viewing online. We thank God for you. I want to get into the word of the Lord. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. And I'm going to start with Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 through 19. I'm also going to read Exodus chapter 3, verse 8. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're going to Isaiah 43, 18 through 19, reading from the New King James Version. For the word of the Lord reads in Isaiah 43, 18 through 19, the Bible says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Tell your neighbor, say neighbor. That's old stuff. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you know it? Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. In Exodus 3 and 8, let's read it. Both of these are going to make sense. They're going to congeal together in just a moment. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites, Hivites and the Jebusites. Exodus 3 and 8. If I could give you a prophetic subject for this evening, it's going to be extremely prophetic. I want to say to you, this is only the beginning. But I want you to prophesy to a neighbor. We prophesy to a neighbor because wherever two or three are gathered, he is the God that's in the midst. Say, neighbor, we're just getting started. Now, I know about three people from TG caught the revelation. Say, neighbor, we're just getting started. I feel sorry for everybody that got comfortable with us in the last season. I feel sorry for everybody that believed that we were at the peak of where we were going, neighbor. I know you don't think that this is it. I know you don't think that the last seven years was all that God was going to do. Neighbor, we are just uh, scraping the surface. Uh, we are just uh, getting started. Uh, I believe that we're coming into a season of reintroduction. Uh, I believe that God is going to allow the believers uh, who have been revived, uh, who have been cleansed, uh, who have been sanctified, uh, who have been expanded. Uh, I believe he's going to give you the liberty uh, to reintroduce yourself to people that thought that they knew you. I believe that he's going to give you the liberty uh, to reintroduce your business that you thought was going to die. I believe he's about to reintroduce ministries uh, that people wrote off. Uh, I don't know who lost hope in the last season, uh, but baby, you're just getting started. Uh, failures, uh, you're just getting started. Uh, mistakes, uh, you're just getting started. Uh, money is low, uh, you're just getting started. Uh, this ain't all, uh, and this ain't it. Uh, we're just, uh, we're just getting started. We 
know that this year is the eighth year anniversary, meaning that it has been seven years. God has worked. He has completed the necessary cycles and systems that he intended for the lives of the believers in this house. There is some significance to the number eight that we have to dig into before I drop these prophetic bombs and allow apostle to come up and apostolically shift in this place. We know that the number eight means new beginnings and I believe we know that just by word, but we don't know the specific implications of the number eight. You look through scripture, you see that Noah and his family, it was eight of them that entered onto the ark. And when God destroyed the entire world by flood, he restarted everything. He reset everything with eight people. Eight people recreated it. Eight people built an empire. Eight people restarted everything that was wiped out. He did it with eight people. When you see the number eight, it deals with the shifting of seats. It deals with God resetting and it deals with God reseating. Did you not know that David wasn't the first son? David wasn't the second son. David wasn't the third son because see, we are very thirsty to be first. We are very thirsty to be seen first. We are very thirsty to graduate first and there's nothing wrong with that. But the Bible says that the prophet came and he overlooked the firstborn son the prophet came in the room and he overlooked the second born son the prophet came in the room and he overlooked the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and even the seventh born son and the prophet was looking for a king and the prophet found kingship in the eighth born son through this son, David, we know that, that here is Jesus Christ coming and rebuilding this new covenant. Although he was there from the beginning of time, he was birthed out of the root. He was birthed out of the lineage of David. We see the number eight again in scripture, not just for seats, but we see the number eight in scripture dealing with circumcision. That when a baby boy was had in the, the Old Testament, the Bible says that, that you could not immediately circumcise that boy. You couldn't immediately cut on that boy. Well, what you had to do was you had to wait for the eighth day before you could circumcise your sons to God. This was the representation of the covenant. I'm going somewhere. I'm just laying a foundation. This is powerful because this symbolizes the covenant that God had with his children. Whenever you see the number eight, you're seeing that God is saying, now I can trust you in this covenant. I've tried you, I've tested you, and I can trust you, meaning that now the covenant works both ways. That if you obey me, you'll eat the good of the land. The covenant starts working both ways. When you do what I tell you to do, I'll rain down heaven. You move out of just the realms of grace and mercy and you start moving into the principles of covenant what's so powerful about circumcision and the Lord told me to tell this house that many of you suffered in the last season because every time you got cut you fell apart the saints have yet to learn how to handle low-level warfare. We're still cussing people out. We're still dealing with road rage. Y'all didn't come to have church. We're, we still got it. We, we're still dealing with a whole lot of low-level warfare. You're still mad at your makeup artist because she did your eyebrows wrong one time. And so the saints, we get cut real easily. He said in the last season we were getting cut and when we got cut we fell apart when we got cut we stopped coming to church when we got cut we didn't want to preach no more but what's so powerful about circumcision on the eighth day is that when you get cut on the eighth day medically the blood is designed to clot up so even when the baby is cut the baby don't bleed out and die who am i preaching to in this season the lord said when you get cut in this year when you get cut in this season it's not gonna take you out of ministry it's not gonna ruin your marriage it's not gonna ruin your finances in this season the believers will get cut but we ain't gonna bleed out i feel the clock coming and when the clock come it's gonna make sure that i survive the persecution 
persecution that I survived the anguish that I survived the issues that I survived the problems last time they cut me in church I almost bled out last time I was persecuted I almost bled out but because we're in the era of the eighth the grace of eighth the covenant of eighth when I get cut this time I believe that many of us are coming into an hour where people are, are, are not going to see you where they were. And, and this is important, saints, because we get cut, we bleed out, and everybody is used to visiting us in ICU. Some of you people know when you call it, it's an ICU moment. They, 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 they know when you call in that you barely can move you barely can pray in tongues y'all I know this is an anniversary some of y'all looking at me like y'all want to fight they know when you come around it's going to be an I see you moment it's I see you in the marriages I see you in our church friendships I see you on our jobs and I said, Lord, I said, I said, Lord, what, 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 what's your plan for the believers? He said, I'm making sure that people are not going to visit you in ICU any longer. But they're going to visit you in victory. This is important because when God changes the identity and he gives you a new beginning, you don't get attention of what used to make you sick anymore. Y'all, 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 y'all. Lord, help me. There is a responsibility coming to this house that people were going to be okay with this house because mm, it's not as big as, as other churches, but they're powerful. You know, people say stuff like they small, but they be powerful. That, that's an ICU statement. They, they say stuff like, um, you know, they, they powerful, they leaders, they powerful, but they young. What they got to do with, it, with anything? Your mama trying to make up her mind right now whether or not she want to die at the cemetery of a church that she in now. All because apostle and prophetess ain't the age she want them to be. As if age means integrity. So people will love you while you're in ICU. They'll give you ICU compliments. And the problem with that is, is us is that we'll, we'll start getting uh, accumulated to those, those compliments. We'll start living our life by those compliments. You'll start creating an identity in those compliments. But the Lord said, the first thing I got to do is I got to condition your mind to no longer receive those I see you compliments. I got to condition the mind of the people in this house. Listen, you can leave that small part off. Just tell us that we powerful. You can leave the part off about them being younger. Just tell us that we powerful. Because what you gonna do when you get in a bigger building, when you get in a bigger space, and people are not able to compliment you because now you're their competition. Tap your neighbor and say, neighbor, I appreciate your compliments. Say, neighbor, I appreciate your kind words. But if it doesn't suit where I'm going, I can't take it up and pack it up with me. If it don't suit what's really on my life, I can't take your compliments with me. Let me get out the way. You can't get used to that. Some stuff you don't need to see as a compliment anymore. The Israelites, they got in trouble with God on several occasions. 
Um, uh, we, we see that the Lord, he, he starts things over by transitioning you out of bondage. You cannot have an entrance without an exodus. And some of you are trying to enter into spaces when you've not exited out of the thing that could kill your miracle. You cannot enter into a new land unless you kill the devils on the inside of you that could eat up your miracle. You can't enter into a new season without letting go of the old season, the old personality, the old way of doing things. The Israelites got in constant trouble with God because while they were in transition, which is where most of us have been, while they were in transition, there was some old stuff that they could not let go of. I want you to know that God is calling the body of Christ out of expired seasons. The danger with expiration is uh, things can still grow even though they are expired. If you leave bread in the package and leave it sitting on your counter, you can open that bread up and there's going to be little bits of mold. There's going to be growth on that bread. But that does not mean that it's healthy growth. The Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years and they grew and they grew and they grew. What happens when you grow in a space that God no longer wants you in? Can I tell some of you what's going on in your life right now? You're trying to grow in an area that you're too big for. You're trying to grow up in spaces that you're too big for all growth ain't good growth how many of us can testify that I would rather be small in my purpose than big in bondage how many of us can testify I may not be a nobody living holy but I would rather be a nobody living holy than being somebody in the world I would rather be a nobody living celibate than be a whoremonger in the world and everybody know my name and everybody know my address and everybody that's seen your birthmark because some of us would rather be known in bondage than not known and be free y'all didn't come to hell church so They, they kept getting in trouble because of the old desires. They kept getting in trouble because of the old cravings and the old appetites. And we all have them. We all have appetites and cravings for the old. They kept getting in trouble because of the old. And then I started asking God. I said, God, what were some of the biggest issues you had with these people? He said, these people, these Israelites, they had prophecies over their life. They had seen me do miracles. They seen me part the Red Sea. They seen me bring water from the rock. I mean, they had survived things uh, that other people would have never survived. I said, so God, what was their problem? He said they had imposter syndrome. Can I take you to counseling? Can I take you to therapy tonight? When you got miracles in front of you, when you got greatness in your belly, when you got greatness on your life, and you broken every generational curse, and you got degrees you shouldn't have had, and you built ministries you shouldn't have built, and you seen God make a way out of nowhere. You seen God heal you when you should have died. And so you walk around acting like you really ain't nobody. You walk around saying, I don't know how it's gonna happen. You walk around angry with the world. You looking for another compliment. You looking for people to help you. When really you got the dog in you You looking at the miracle You looking at the testimony And so when you have imposter syndrome The evidence is there Everybody can see it But you don't I'm looking at a room full of imposters and this is how I know you're an imposter because you waiting on somebody else to cast out the devil when you got the power. See, imposters sit back uh, and they believe that they are not worthy of being in the starting five. Uh, can I prophesy over this house? Uh, God came to deal with every imposter. You better stop acting like
like you a grasshopper when you really a giant you better stop acting like you ain't got the holy ghost every time the enemy comes up against your mind and tries to make you believe that there's an imposter in you i don't care what the devil says i don't care what hell pronounces i'm a big dog in the spirit and any devil that comes up against me any devil that comes up against this house any devil that comes up against my marriage go have to see the holy ghost why are the believers acting like imposters? Neighbor, you act like you don't know. You act like you don't know that the word says that he'll give you houses you didn't build. You an imposter. You an imposter because you go in the room and you tell the bankers what you want to pay. When you a believer with the Holy Ghost. When you're a believer with the Holy Ghost, you win the battles with credit in the courtroom of heaven. How do I know they were imposters? Number 13, Numbers 13 and 33 tells us that when they got to scoping out the land, God had already said, y'all are my chosen people. Anybody that makes you an enemy is an enemy to me. I will fight for you. These are all of the, the pronouncements that God made over these people. And they got right there and surveyed the land and said, we're like grasshoppers to them. They got right there to the land. And they thought because the people were older that they were better. They got right there to the land. And they started sizing up the size of their church to their church. They got right there to the land and they got in the flesh. And they started comparing physical things that you can only measure in the spirit. You know what's happening with the body? We're measuring anointing. By physical things and not by the spirit. Come on in the room. Y'all ain't in here. Come on in the room. You know where we didn't got in trouble at Dr. Stubbs? Is we measure anointing by numbers. We measure anointing by physical things. Instead of measuring the anointing by the spirit of God. Artificial fruit. Genetically modified fruit. And although genetically modified fruit grows, you ain't come to have church up there. I need to find me a church. Is the church on this row? I need a church. Where my church at? Y'all convicted. Where TG at? See, in the 60s, men of God, they started creating genetically modified fruit. This is where they went to the lab and they, they took away certain things and they added certain things chemically and they started creating seeds. They changed the DNA, the original structure of how God intended for fruit to grow. They went to a lab and they created new seeds so that they could grow fruit faster so that they could grow more fruit. But the problem with this, although it grew faster, although the fruit was bigger, although the fruit looked the same, although the fruit smelled the same, although you taste the fruit, when people consume genetically modified fruit, it makes them sick. And the reason I know in the church that we're consuming the fruit of people who was created in the lab of pornography, they still struggling in their zippers. How I know that the people are eating genetically modified fruit is because the believers are still sick. That ain't no real fruit. That fruit 
if it grows real slow if nobody else wants to wait I don't want no genetically modified fruit give me the real teal give me real leaders give me a real anointing give me real all give me real breakthrough I don't want fake miracles I don't want fake breakthroughs I don't want fake sermons give me the real teal tap your neighbor and say neighbor I'm the real deal. Ain't nothing fake over here. I'm the real deal. The all that you get out of me, it's a real all. I paid for this all. I was persecuted for this all. I was talked about for this all. I was abandoned for this all. I was left behind for this all. I had some hard days and I cried in the midnight hour. This all that you looking at, I paid for it. TG, the Lord said payday is coming. You pay for the oil, you pay for the anointing, you pay for the breakthroughs, you pay for the power. You can still grow in an expired season. The Lord says, it's very, it's, it's, it's understand, I'm, I'm getting out of here, I'm almost done. He said, tell the people, you can still love a place or a person, and you can still leave it. They didn't hear me. Because this is what I heard, TG. And y'all know I love y'all, but I came in here to do the work. The Lord says some of your private disobedience is affecting the corporate miracles. I'm gonna say it again. Some of your private disobedience is affecting the corporate miracles. You think that the only reason you leaving a relationship or leaving a friendship or leaving something that no longer belongs in your system, you think in order to leave it, I don't have to love it anymore. But the Lord said, when you obey me, there's going to be some things that you got to leave even though you still love them. There's going to be some people you got to leave even though you still love them. I love you, but I got to go. I love smoking, but I got to go. I like lemon drops, but I got to go. They loved Egypt. We know this because they got the reminiscing. Every time you get good in your consecration, I sure do miss him. Now you should be standing on business. What kind of shoes you got on? You can't stand on business and heels. You need to put on the shoes of the Lord and the gospel of peace and stand on business so that the kingdom can advance. We trying to move but the toe of the body because you part of the body. You a piece of the body. The body trying to move but the toe got an infection. We can't move until we heal the toe. The body trying to move but the stomach got an infection because you think that your private disobedience isn't affecting the miracles in the house. We trying to have breakthroughs and revivals, but the fingers got an infection. So we spending more time in the church, taking anti antibiotics for two weeks, trying to clear up infections. And every time we get over one infection, here go an argument between sister so-and-so and sister so-and-so. Every time we get over one infection, here you are breaking your celibacy back in the car with a nappy head Negro. Every time you break her, hey, we clear up that infection. Here you go, mad at prophetess because you didn't like the prophetic word. We got to get delivered. I gotta go. I gotta go. I need everybody in TG to find a sister or the brother and say, we gotta go. Tell, and you ain't talking loud because you convicted. I said, find a sister or a brother and say, I love your dog. I like shouting with your dog. But you got to get delivered because we got to go. And we can't leave you behind because we ain't coming in with you. We can't leave you behind because you
you belong here. But Carl, you got to get to live it because we got to go. Deuteronomy 20, 16 through 18. But the cities of these people which the Lord your God gives you is an inheritance. You shall let nothing that breathes remain alive. But you shall utterly destroy them. Lord, I don't want to get in trouble in Memphis. Y'all. Y'all. When he gave the Israelites, when he gave them their new beginning, y'all, he gave them instructions. We focus on the land of milk and honey. He said, I will give you a land flowing with milk and honey. That was the promised land. But he didn't just promise them the promised land. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 26, 3 through 18, he says, but, but I am giving you the cities of these people. He said, destroy everything, and I'm going to give you the city of the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Zebulites. I'm going to give you the cities of all of these people. Now here, and I'm going. I'm getting out of the way. I learned that believers like to worship, but believers don't like to wrestle. Worship is for birthing. Wrestling is for killing. We birthed a lot. We started a lot. But when is the last time you killed something? When is the last time you brought down principalities in your season? When it, we, we, we birthed well. But we don't, we don't wrestle well. We worship good. We, we do a great job. And God receives our worship. But we don't like to wrestle. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And, and, and I heard the Lord say that TG, it, it's time to wrestle. It's time for us to get in the ring. There, there are some territories that belong to you. There are some houses. There are some anointings. There are some properties. There are some businesses. There are some connections. There are some open doors that belong to you. And if you knew how powerful you were, if you knew how big you were in the spirit, you will understand that the devil is resisting you. And so when the devil is resisting you, you gonna have to mount up wings like eagles. You're going to have to get out of your feelings. You're going to have to turn off yeah glow and try to get glow in true generation. And you're going to have to go forth and you're going to have to wrestle with that devil that don't want to see you in a ring. You're going to have to wrestle with that devil that don't want to see you get to the next level. We ain't wrestling. Each of these particular groups of people served a different God. Sometimes the enemy don't want you to move because when you move into a neighborhood, what was governing that neighborhood got to move out. Some of y'all think y'all fighting people when you really fight principalities. You ain't fighting no bankers, you fighting principality. Because when TG get in the building that TG supposed to be in, when the people of TG get in the houses that the people of TG supposed to be in, when the people in TG get the promotions that TG supposed to have, everybody in the company gonna have to submit to the Holy Ghost. And them demons of greed gonna have to move out when you move in. The enemy don't want you there because every principal Every snake, every scorpion go have to come out when you come in. Look at three people and say, I'm coming in, I'm coming in. Find three people and prophesy. I'm moving into the neighborhood and the gangs go have to go. I'm moving into the neighborhood and the homosexuality go have to go. I'm coming up the ladder and every demonic force that's in the company go have to go. This 
is just, it's just the beginning. The Bible says that on the first day, the Lord said, let there be light. Apostle Jonathan says that light means order. The Lord said, let there be order. Then he started creating the seas, the land, separating the waters from the waters, creating the animals. And then on the seventh day, he rested. They didn't record the eighth day, but the eighth day was there. The eighth day was the beginning of everything working together. And I know y'all lost some people, and I know there's some people that can't celebrate with us today, but the Lord says uh, that this eighth year going to make a whole lot of sense uh, because this is the year that Romans 8 and 28 uh, is going to be manifested in this house. Uh, that all of the hell y'all been through, all of the people you cried over, all of your sons you had to bury, you had to bury your daddy, Pierre, you had to go through the persecution, uh, you had to go through the heartbreak, uh, but the Lord says uh, in the eighth year, all oh, things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. I prophesy that year one going to work together, year two going to work for your good, year three going to bring a miracle, year four going to bring marriages, year five going to bring breakthrough, year six going to bring promotion, year seven going to bring miracles, and year eight, everything is going to make sense in this year. You are the open up your mouth huh? oh come on you believe it open up your mouth in Memphis and make some noise in the building if you believe it's on the way, open up your mouth and give God glory. Hallelujah in this place. He's worthy of all the praise. If you believe you're just getting started, open up your mouth in Memphis and give God a praise and praise. Give God worship. Give God glory. Come on! Yeah, hallelujah! My God, my God, my God, my God! Woo! There's so much God is saying, and I'm about to clarify some things. You have turned to Genesis chapter 26. I just want to add, she's made it much easier for me. I'm just going to go on over to the finish line. Praise the Lord. Genesis chapter 26. I want to give honor to these two giants in the kingdom of God. Can y'all help me celebrate Chief Apostle Kenneth D. Cunningham and Prophetess Erica Cunningham. Come on, can we celebrate them? Hallelujah. These leaders with a global mandate. We honor you. We thank God for you. They have been such a gift to me and prophetess. And when I believe whenever you get a gift, you cherish and you honor it. And so I love both of you immensely. And I thank God for both of you for just being the leaders you are, loving me and my wife, showing me authenticity. We're in a time now loyalty and authenticity is dried up. And so we want to appreciate people who reverence what authenticity, there's no agenda, real, true, powerful, anointed. Can we celebrate them one more time? Come on, these global leaders. Hallelujah. Amen. And can I, you just help me celebrate. No, my blonde loves to have fun. <laughs> She's my blondie, y'all. <laughs> And she makes me look good. She's a part of my apostolic work. Y'all help me celebrate the global prophetess, my wife, my baby mama of three girls. Hallelujah. Prophetess Ashley Brown. Can y'all help me celebrate my wife in the building? The love of my life. I just got to say, no one can out preach. No one can out prophesy, out dress, out cook, out clean. My wife, and I honor you and thank God for you. I preach better when you're in the room. Amen.
Dominion City Troop Generation, make some noise. We love you, Troop Generation. We love you, Dominion City. And everyone else that's in the building, all five for ministry gifts. I don't want to call any names. I definitely want to acknowledge uh, this man of God. It means a lot to me. Bishop Jason Stubbs. Can we celebrate this man of God? He don't like attention, y'all. <laughs> but I give you honor. Thank you for being here. God bless you. All right, Genesis chapter 26. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. We're going to go to verse number one, and I'm going to skip down to verse number 12. The Lord is saying so much to this house, and you know, when, when you go behind a prophet, uh, half your message is gone. Praise the Lord. And so <laughs> we're just going to flow as the Lord leads. Genesis chapter 26, verse number one. Um, this is what God is saying. Uh, and I'm going to flow apostolically and prophetically as the Lord leads. The Bible says, and there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham and Isaac went unto Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, unto Gorah. Verse number 12. Then Isaac sold in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man waxed great, grew great, went forward and grew until he became very great. This is what's happening in this house. There's about to be a great expansion, a great growth that's about to take place among Troop Generation Church. Get ready, says the Lord. You're about to wax great, so great that they're not going to be able to contain you. So great they're not going to be able to restrict you. So great they can't put a cap over your head. God said, get ready for expansion. And... Uh, Verse 14 says, For he had possession of the flocks and possession of the herds and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. For all the wells which his father's servants and had digged in the days of Abraham, his father Philistines had stopped them and filled them up with earth. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. And Isaac departed thence and pinched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there and Isaac did again the wells of water which had dig in the days of Abraham his father hallelujah I want to stop there I want to come from a subject I want to talk about from pivot to promise from pivot to promise there's the promise is about to be in your possession no more waiting on it no more looking forward no more hoping for the Lord says the promise is about to be in your possession, but it's going to come into your possession when you make a pivot. Touch your neighbor and say pivot, pivot, pivot. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want to deal with as we're talking about from pivot to promise. The Lord began to talk to me about uh, this house, truth generation, and he's beginning to speak to me about specific things that he wants to be revealed today in this house. And what he talked about me about, he says that this house is in the midst of transition. And as you are in the midst of transition, all seasons of transition will bring tension. This tension will begin to settle in the midst between the house. And the tension does not necessarily mean it's a bad thing. But the tension is designed to test the heart of loyalty. Many of you, if you're in the midst of transition, your marriage, there's tension in the household. You know I, mean? I mean, there's tension that's sitting there, whether we want to agree on the finances, whether we want to agree with making sure your mama stay out of the business of the family, whether we want to agree, there's tension that takes place. Many of you, with your finances, you're dealing with tension. You're dealing with tension, whether I should make this financial decision, whether I should join this financial network, what should I do? There's tension that comes. And the Lord says, in this house, there has been tension because the tension is designed to test loyalty of the heart. He says, the tension in this house has everything to do with true generation shifting from a pastoral framework to an apostolic paradigm. And God raises up apostolic leaders who have vision. These apostolic leaders have vision that is designed to help mobilize, is designed to help impart, and is designed to 
occupy a city. And so what happens when this tension comes into the room, because people, when it comes to transition, tension is very hard. Tension comes in to interfere with transition. And so when the apostle has transition in mind, and God begins to tell him, hey, I'm going to need to move some people around in this season of transition. It's nothing personal, but I got to move some people around because you can't marry positions in the church. Jesus married the church, so we don't have to marry the church. But when you're insecure, you live through a position. And how you know you live through a position when it's time for you to move, you throw a pity party, you get all of your feelings because you don't know how to transition when God says transition. You don't know how to pivot when God says pivot. And so when the apostle says, hey, I want you to move from the praise and worship team and I want you to move the first touch. I want you to move from youth ministry and I want you to move to the media department. I want you to move from the media department and I want you to move from the intercessors team. Some of us get into our feelings and we get mad and we don't like the transition but God says that tonight we got to learn how to get into kingdom alignment. If God is moving me, it's because he prepared me for the other side of the vision, for the crossover of the vision. So I'm not going to push back against the vision with a spirit of rebellion. See, David said, I cannot go to battle with Saul's armor because it has not been proven. And what the tension does, the tension is designed to prove or to test who's really loyal. Because you don't really don't know who's loyal until it's time for them to get corrected. We don't know who's loyal until it's time for you to receive rebuke. We don't know who's loyal until it's time for you to sit down for a few weeks. The moment you're serving, you're here early. The moment you're here serving, you pay tithes. The moment you're here serving, you vacuum the carpet. But when the apostle says and prophet says, take a few weeks and sit down and receive. Now you're coming late. Now you don't want to give. Now you don't want to pray. Now you don't want to intercede now you don't want to sow and the Lord says can you pass the test many of you married people and you don't know them when they're angry I gotta know you when you're mad I gotta know you when you're offended I gotta know you when you're tempted I gotta know you when you're hurting who are you how do you respond to being tested Well, God is looking to rebuild Zion. He says Zion has to be built strong. Oh, come on, help me in this church. Oh, we need mothers in Zion. But we don't have mothers in Zion because we got too many cougars in Zion. Oh, we got to get into a position in the church to where we understand that we have a responsibility to advance the kingdom of God. That we understand we have a responsibility to honor the glory of God. I got to move on, I got to move on. I gotta move on. And then the Bible says in Genesis 26 and verse number 12, before I get to that, it's dealing with something that is powerful because I want us to understand as we're talking about knowing or testing and proving, in when transition, as we're dealing with transition and pivoting to promise, you have to begin to deal with the Leviathan spirit. One of the main characteristics of a Leviathan spirit, it means to twist things. And then you see animals like crocodiles, they're designed that when they begin to bite their prey, how they begin to choke the oxygen or to release the oxygen out of their prey, they like to twist and move their prey. And God is saying, this is a season for this house that we got to stop twisting things. God help me. Oh, hallelujah in here. We got to stop twisting comments. We got to stop twisting what's being said in meetings. We got to stop twisting what's said in sermons. Ain't nobody said you. We ain't talking about you we're talking about the collective house but when you have a he ear that's consumed with trauma you always twist the sermons to saying they don't like me they preach at me they say I'm crazy they say I don't belong there you twist my words I didn't say you didn't belong here I said you gotta get in line if you're gonna stay here but you gotta stop twisting the words that God is 
is sent to bring you out of bondage. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, I'm talking to some husbands. Stop twisting the words of your wife. She didn't cut you down. She didn't say you want no man. She didn't say, I just need some more time. But you heard what you're saying. I ain't taking care of the house. I ain't taking care of my... Do- Stop twisting up words and learn to hear from a healed ear. I got to move on in here. In Genesis chapter number 26, uh, Isaac is the one we're talking about. And what makes this passage so powerful is that it mirrors Genesis 20. Because the same aspect of dynamic of what we see Isaac live again, he's reliving history of his father. It's a familiar spirit. And familiar spirits study bloodlines. They study generation after generation. And so when it's your turn to walk into your 20s, when it's your turn to walk into ministry, when it's your turn to walk into your marriage, the enemy is already studying your generation. He studied your daddy. He studied your mama. He studied the bloodline. And so when he makes it to you, he knows how to reintroduce the same bondage that your daddy got killed in. Who am I talking to in this room? And so Isaac now has to deal with a familiar spirit. He has to deal with the same thing daddy dealt with. He has to deal with the same family that daddy dealt with. He lies and says Rebecca is his sister and not his wife. Abraham lies like Sarah is not his wife but his sister. He then has to deal with the same level of bondage that he had to deal with stopped up wells. And so I want to talk to some people in this room that you had to deal with familiar spirits. That you see the same thing that your granddaddy and your daddy dealing with now trying to come down to you you see the same addiction of throwing wands at the stripper pole trying to come down to you you say the same addiction of smoking drugs and drinking trying to come down to you you see the same addiction from the previous generation trying to come down to you but I got news in Memphis that God is about to give you strength God is about to give you power to break every familiar spirit say it's gonna bypass me it's gonna bypass my marriage it's gonna bypass my health it's gonna bypass my kids it's gonna bypass my mind it's gonna bypass my finances if you believe that it's about to bypass you open up your mouth and say it's about to bypass my church it's about to bypass my apostle it's about to bypass my prophetess if you believe it throw your head back and scream hallelujah hallelujah let me go deeper here and so as we go on deeper into the text the bible god help me it says in the word of God, but the Lord told me, he says specifically, he says, I want you to deal with some few things. And so number chapter 12, it said, then Isaac sowed in that land, which means there was a famine in Isaac's time, but he just couldn't sow in any land. There was a specific land that God required Isaac to sow in that will reap the inheritance by his investment. And the Lord told me that this house will be that land. And then when you learn to sow in this hand, this house, when you sow in that house, when you sow time in that house, when you sow money in that house, he said, this house is going to reap direct return. He said, get ready for a hundredfold. Get ready to see blessings overflow. Get ready when you come here, you're coming unemployed. But when you leave here, you have a six-figure salary. When you're coming to this house, he says, I sanction an anointing for strategic wealth. But strategic wealth is going to take strategic sowing. The world tries to tell us, don't sow money to church. Come on, let's go here. Or we're content with just tithing. Tithing is not giving. Tithing is returning. Because the tenth don't belong to you. It belongs to God. So when you tithe, you return back what belongs to him. 
So giving comes through the dynamic of sowing. Isaac understood the principle of sowing. And I know some of you in the room, I don't know how I'm going to sow. I don't know how can I sow extravagantly. Well, I begin to teach my church. And what I tell them strategically, everybody in this room, go pull up your Chase Wells Fargo. Go pull up your credit union account and begin to look at all the money of fast food that you spent for the whole entire month. And if you look at the money you spent on fast food the money you spent on chipotle the money you spent on longhorn the money you spent on five guys that's your life bill the money you spent on porch and parlor the money you spent on roof chris you have way more than enough to sow back into the kingdom of god and so you look at your expenses if i would cut back a few dinners and i would learn to eat food at home i would have extra money to sow into my church because if we're gonna move to the other side you have to put your money where your mouth is You're going to have to put your money where your mouth is. I know you love your church. I know you love your leaders. But put your money where your mouth is. I'm going to let money drop all over this church. I'm going to drop money all over this church. Why is it necessary? Because many of you, you wouldn't even still be here if it wasn't for this church. Some of you, you would not be married if it wasn't for this church. Some of you wouldn't be in your right mind if it wasn't for this church. Some of you wouldn't even have a business if it wasn't for this church. Because have the church support your business anyhow. So why don't you take time to sow back into the kingdom of God? The Bible, I'm almost done. The Bible says... The man waxed great, went forward and grew until he became great. Now, the Bible says, when his possessions of flocks, in verse 14, possession of herds, great store of servants, and Philistines, watch the Bible says, the Philistines envied him. And I began to settle on this because the Lord told me, he says, there's some work we're going to have to do tonight. And part of the work we're going to have to do, because what we must understand, success attracts assassins. Everybody wants to be successful, until successful attracts assassins because it's not that they don't respect what you have it's just they don't want you to get there some of you it's not that you're blessed it's the fact that it's you that has the blessing Come on, if it was anybody else in the family, they will be fine. If it was anybody else in the city, they will be fine. If it was anybody else down the street, it will be fine. But the fact that it's you, is it brings them in a place of emotional bondage. Then the Lord said we have to begin in, 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 in this moment apostolically to deal with uh, demonic trademarks. He says there's demonic trademarks that is over this city and over this church that he says that he's dealt with but I want to to highlight the demonic trademark the demonic trademarks that of culture and media is placing over Memphis is that this is the leading murderer capital of the US it's a demonic trademark that has to be torn down and it's going to be torn down because God is going to raise up a church that has intercessors that's going to go in the spirit realm and tear down every demonic trademark that's over this city that Memphis won't be known by murder Memphis won't be known by bondage Memphis won't be known by gang activity Memphis won't be known by drugs and alcohol Memphis won't be known by bondage but he said Memphis won't even be known he said it won't be known by three dead kings he said it won't be known by a dead king named Elvis it won't be known by a dead king Martin Luther King who died at a hotel in Memphis it won't be known by the rapper or king of Memphis by the name of Young Dolph but he said Memphis will be known by the king of kings and the lord of lords and his name is Jesus he said people all over the world is coming to Memphis not to Graceland not to the Remain Motel but they're coming for revival they're coming for miracles they're coming for healing they're coming for breakthrough if you believe it open up your mouth and give God praise in this house
Let me, let me go deeper. The reason why this strategy by the media, culture, people of these different entities that are trying to come against the city of Memphis, the Lord showed to me like this. In the natural, FedEx is the second largest cargo aviation system in our nation. FedEx comes through Memphis, and Memphis pretty much is the breach of the top end of the entire southeast. So if you need products in the southeast of the nation, it has to come through Memphis. This is why many of us, we're praying when your product make it to Memphis. Y'all don't want to help me have church in here. Come on, I'm talking about some women when your product, come on, she in. And I'm talking about those of Fashion Nova. I'm talking about when your new Gucci shoes has to come through Memphis. You shakatadababaka. Hoping that it makes it to your address. Because it has to come through. It has to come through Memphis before it makes it to Mississippi. It has to come through Memphis before it makes it to Alabama. It has to come through Memphis before it makes it to Georgia. It has to come through Memphis before it makes it to Louisiana. It has to come through Memphis before it makes it to Florida. And so this is what the Lord told me. He said, just like it is in the natural, so is it in the spirit. Revival will hit the southeast of the nation but it will first start with Memphis. He said Memphis is the firstborn of the dispensation of revival that's going to hit the southeast of this nation. When it starts in Memphis, it's going to travel on down. When miracles hit Memphis, it's going to travel on down. When deliverance hits Memphis, it's going to travel on down. So this is why we got to intercede for Memphis because when it hits Memphis first, it's going to take the entire southeast. He said Memphis is the first war of revival. He said Memphis is the first fruit of revival that's going to hit the southeast of this nation. He says it's going to start at Truth Generation. It's going to start in this house. It's going to start with a remnant of churches in this city that's going to take revival throughout the southeast. This is why the warfare is so intense. This is why resistance and labels have been placed over this city. Because God is going to start with Memphis first. This entire city and it is going to begin to hover over the entire southeast. Uh, yeah, now you know why the enemy wants Memphis bad. Now you know why the enemy is fighting Memphis. Now you know why CNN is talking about Memphis. Now you know why Fox News and Channel 5 ABC and all of them are talking about Memphis. Because they understand that the enemy understands on heaven's agenda is to start through Memphis and take over the entire to finish this. I'm almost done. I promise you I gotta get out of here. Hallelujah. And so she called it out by He said, then deal with the demonic trademark over this church. I'm gonna say it. She said, I'm gonna say it again because this is how serious the Lord is about it. He's that serious about it. He wants to say it twice. In both, he gave it to both of us. The Lord showed me a meeting in this city, Zoom meeting with older leaders in this city who've been discussing this house and the leadership of this house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I'm on Facebook Live, but I'm that bold. I'm in my office tonight. They can come find me in Cleveland, Dominion City Church, if they want to find me. Listen, he told me a strategic meeting. And what he began to collect and say, listen, we got to begin to, to end it. We got to stop that church. Who he think he is to keep plowing through COVID. Who he think he, who they think they are. They're young. So what they planted into the region to discourage people from looking this direction, he said that what he, they said was, they're anointed but they're young and the young that they're using is not necessarily by age he's trying to plant that it's inexperienced and unlearned 
but the Lord sent this apostle to Memphis tonight to tear down this demonic trademark and this lie on this city that's trying to come against this house that age ain't got nothing to do with it. In fact, God used oh, well, Joshua Young. He used Samuel Young. And God said he gonna prove to those preachers in their group chats. He's gonna prove to those preachers on their Zoom calls. He's gonna prove to those preachers in their phone conversation that he's gonna prove that this young house, that they labor with false demonic trademarks is gonna take over every four corner of the city. He said, true generation, get ready to dig in Collierville. Get ready to dig in Cordova. Get ready to dig in Germantown. Get ready to dig in Bartlett. Get ready to dig on Fraser. Get ready to dig on Poplar. Get ready to dig on Airways. Get ready to dig on Union Street. Get ready to dig downtown. Get ready to dig wells that will feed, that will quench the thirst of a nation, the thirst of a city. If you believe it, throw your head back and open up your mouth and give God. two more points and I'm, I'm about to land this one of the things in the text because she took most of my message, so I'm coming back to the text I just want to close I want to leave this with true generation he said one of the things I was he said told me to tell this house he says we have to make room and making room is not just a new building making room means we have to be mature enough to slide over and let the families that are coming here. The Lord says he's given this house and this leadership a multi-dimensional anointing. The influence that is about to increase is not just going to deal in the church sector, but it's going to deal with the political sector. Come on, I see partnerships with Mayor pa Paul Young. I see God using this house in every sector, po the political sector. He says, I'm going to use you in the business sector. And he says, he's merging this house between ministry and marketplace. Because of where he's taking this house. He's sending kingdom benefactors that are going to come and sow. And I'm talking about sowing by the thousands. But he says, truth generation, you can't have the only child syndrome. What is the only child syndrome? I got, I got three girls. Layla's 10, Ivy's four, Savannah, my youngest, she'll be one on the 21st of this month. When Savannah wasn't here, when she was in my wife's belly, Ivy was used to being the youngest. Ivy was the one that was spoiled and Layla was spoiled as well. Ivy was the one that got the intention and got the nur nurturing and all of that that she needed. But then there was a time where our family was expanding. And because the family was expanding, here comes another baby that's coming into the way. And you can't, God, we taught Ivy, you got to make room for what's on the way. You can't get mad or envious about what's coming. You matter, but we have to make space because mama and daddy is not just called just for us. Mommy and daddy is called, come on, to this nation. We have to make room to share them. We make them, but when you are the only child syndrome, you don't want to share mama and daddy. You want all the meetings. You get offended when they can't call you right away, when they can't call you back the same hour. We get offended because we got the only child syndrome. But God said, because of the growth, I'm getting ready to sin. He said, this church is expanding. This network work is expanding this ministry is expanding and we can't have the only child syndrome it's not just about you it's not just about your feelings make room so everybody can get what they need I need
future generation to look at a neighbor and say, neighbor, make room for the next level. Make room for the harvest. Make room for more prophets. Make room for more intercessors. Make room for the evangelists. Make room for the pastors that are coming. Make room for the entrepreneurs. Make room for sinners. Make room for the white people. Make room for Hispanics. Make room. 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 Hallelujah. This is my last point. And I gotta get out of your way. I got the clothes. I gotta land this. Here's my last point. Here's my last point for the house. And the Lord says, he says, it's, it, it, there has been a digging taking place. He's, he's causing this house to dig wells. This house is a house of well diggers. He says, deep calls you unto deep. The tragedy we have in a church, being deep is an insult. So we got to make apologies. I ain't trying to be deep. Listen, I'm trying to be deep because my God is deep. And because I go into the realms of prayer, because I speak in my heavenly language for hours, God gives me mysteries that allow me to go into the deep. But maybe you want to be on shallow water. Maybe you want to be in the same place for the rest of your life. But I'm coming to go deep. And the Lord said, many of you, as you dig wells, as you dig in worship, as you dig in prayer, as you dig an intercession he says I'm building a deeper well and when you have a deeper well you can do two services because I got a deep well I'm not complaining after the first service because I got a deep well apostle if you need to go to three service I got a deep well in the other building when we outgrow that one and go to two service I got a deep well and I'm not complaining about lone worship I'm not complaining about another service I'm not complaining about sowing twice because I got a deep well I got a well that's dug out in worship I got a well that's dug out in fasting I got a well that's dug out in worship if you believe it Throw your head back and give God a... And what water represents in the scripture, it represents the spirit, but not just the spirit, it also represents creation and new beginnings. Water represents new beginnings. The Lord says as we're digging, as we're digging, it's going to produce wells that a region can come and drink from. And what the Lord says is, as he was digging wells, he had resistance. The first place was Ezek that came against them that represents strife or contention. Contention rose up against Isaac to stop him from digging the wells. And what I love about this context is understanding what contention is that Isaac strategically understands. The Lord shows him that you got to reserve your energy for what's ordained for your life. Some of you are tired and overwhelmed is because you're exerting energy to battles God never ordained for you to fight. And pride will tell you, let me go after every battle that comes my way. But no, wisdom says, listen, if I got to fight for this man, this man obviously is not mine. He's yours. I ain't got to fight. Well, who am women I'm talking to in the room? You got to talk into a place. I'm tired of fighting over men. Listen, if I got to fight over him, he's not mine. If I got to argue with you, if I had to go back and forth, obviously he's not mine. And then the Lord told me, he said, he said, what he's getting ready to do? Because he said also with contention in the Hebrew, what's added to also is competition. Isaac didn't have time to compete. Because he said, I'm going to dig my own lane. 
ministries in the body of Christ are competing against each other. And what truth generation has, you have your own lane. God says he's giving you the anointing to dig your own well when you ain't got to borrow from nobody else. You ain't got to beg nobody else. The Lord said the well that I'm digging that you're going to have, it's going to be yours. You ain't got to fight for it. You ain't got to go for it. He says this well that I'm giving this house. He says when you dig it, you're going to dig it well. You're going to dig it until it opens up. If you believe it, open up your mouth and give God glory. And the contention represents, listen, the contention, God said, he told me that he says, there can be, he says, the only thing that can stop this church is this church. The scripture says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. One of the enemy primary agenda for this house, because he know he can't stop you. He know he cannot stop what God has birthed, what God has ordained. He knows the level of anointing in this house. I want you all to work diligently to protect this house with unity because what the enemy will try to do is bring contention and strife in the midst of this house to stop the advancement of this house and we have a responsibility to protect it with unity which means we're going to do like Isaac I'm going to have to stop digging in other people's business <laughs> I'm going to have to overlook some stuff. Come on, if there's going to be unity, let's just be real. People going to be people. Somebody going to say something crazy. Somebody going to do something crazy. But wisdom says, listen, I put the promise over my preference, and I'm going to overlook what was said. I ain't got time to entertain that because our unity is more important than my, get my point or my ideal being right. And some of you get mad when your idea don't be right or people don't listen to your idea. But it's not about your idea. It's about the vision. And I place the vision of this house over my idea so when something is said I overlook it that's my sister I love her that's my brother I love him and he need gatekeepers in this house that when somebody get offended and they bring to you mess you say listen don't bring that mess to me you go to your sister but the Bible says if a man offends you go to your brother don't go to the other brothers in the house don't go to somebody else don't go to another church the Bible says go to your brother so this church cannot be stopped I prophesy unstoppable but the only thing that can stop this house is this house so we declare tonight that we won't get in our own way that we won't fight each other that there won't be no contention we're going to build together we're going to grow together we're going to worship together we're going to do kingdom together because that's the will for this house and I decree and declare that every silent offense every demonic agenda to bring the house against each other we counsel it now in the name of Jesus no spiritual lupus for lupus is the only autoimmune disease that attacks his own body we declare the spiritual lupus is counseled in the name of Jesus we will not attack our own not attack all. We're not attack each other. We're going to move forward. And so the Lord says they moved to Rehoboth. And Rehoboth was the place where he could build because there was no contention. There was no strife, no opposition, no hatred. And he was able to dig the well that God had for the legacy of their life. I've come to tell you that what God has for this house it's going to be so big that we've got to make room for it. My testimony is I, I you know, just moved into our, our building at Dominion City uh, this past September, uh, September of 2023. And uh, we were doing an apostolic work in a, a small town called Bowl that's outside of Cleveland, Mississippi. And the leaders of that city came together and said, we're tired of this church. Come on. We don't want this church to continue to do it. They, they, they're taking up the streets. They're parking all over the side of the street. 
they're, they're taking over the city. People are coming to our city. Our city has noise. It used to be quiet. This church is a problem. They told the, the landlord that allowed us to rent in that facility. They said he, they got to go and they got to go within the next 60 days. Get them out of the city. We want to shut them down. It was a plan of the enemy because the enemy thought that was going to shut down our ministry. And listen, the landlord came to me. She says, I'm sorry. I got to let you go. I said, well, we pay our rent on time. We, we pay over. We clean. We added things to the building. Haven't we been good to you? Uh, uh, yeah. She couldn't look in my eyes. Yeah, yeah. It's just, I don't know. I just, the bank and so much going on. I just, I'm, I'm going to have to let you go. Then I said, please, can we stay this way? Our, our church has nowhere to go. Can we please stay here? She said these words, and these words bless me. She says, you don't belong here. And it pierced me. And the Lord says, say it slow. You don't belong here. Your season is up. So moving forward, moving forward, we moving forward, we left, and I'm a pastor now, can't have church. Don't have no place to have church on Sundays. It's been two weeks now. I don't know what to tell my people. I'm desperate, I'm looking. And God told me to call a friend of ours. They call Apostle Young. Tell him uh, that you need a place to worship. We told him. His church, they were there for us. They led us to come into their, to their church to have services. He sacrificed his night service. They have night services off. He sacrificed the nights to let us have church. Because that is kingdom. Kingdom is churches making room for other churches to do kingdom. So while I was there, there were so many stumbling blocks. We were trying to get approved for a loan to get our own building. So many stumbling blocks. I mean, stumbling blocks coming our way. Six months, no, no help. No banker will help us. Because bankers don't want to really help churches. They look at churches as being problematic because people tithe. Sometimes the people don't tithe, and then they get mad. So I kept believing. We kept praying. We kept plowing. And the Lord opened the door through the banker. When, he, when I, me and my associate pastor, when we came into the room, he says, I don't know why I feel like I need to help you. And God will raise up people that will say, I... I just need to help you. I don't know. I don't know you. I don't know what, but I need to help you. And so they helped us, but the loan they gave us was a small amount compared to what we needed to pay to get the building renovated. And the Lord told me, he says, I did it on purpose because I don't want you going in too much debt. I want you to believe that through your house, I'm going to raise the money that's needed to fund this vision to renovate this building so that you and your church can have worship. Listen, when I began to get in the project and examine how much money it was going to take, I was nervous, afraid. The Lord says, it's in the house. He will never place a vision over the house if he doesn't place the provision in the house. So we believe God. There's a super seed Sunday. And I don't, it's not a, just, we don't have a whole lot of rich people in our church. We we all trying to work and maintain, but we all sacrifice. And on Super Seed Sunday, we all believe God. We all sold together corporately as a church $47,000 in one Sunday. I saw supernaturally God send people who, who wouldn't even remember the church. I just want to write this church a $10,000 check. We saw that through prayer, through sacrifice, through being unified through the process. We saw it. So we kept on, but more, the building project kept being more expensive. Material, inflation is jacking up prices. And so we had to keep pressing and they kept giving, we kept giving, kept sowing. And we didn't go have a fish fry, God help me. We didn't have them all prep breakfast. We all just came together and said, we gotta do what we gotta do, Apostle. We gotta do what we got. We got to sow into the kingdom. We got to sow into the because We believe that God is gonna see this come to pass. So month after month, I saw God supernaturally through sowing, sacrificial sowing, began to honor the vision that we had of renovating this property. Every month, things were getting paid off. We got toward the end. And what I've learned about construction projects, time means money. And you're behind. <laughs> you're behind. It's going to cost you more money. We got behind almost a month. And we were at the end of our budget. We were at the end of it. We had no more money left. And I said, how much money do we need to finish this? 
The contractor looked at me and said, you're going to need at least $55,000 to finish this. And I told my church, we won't be in the building by September the 1st. I gave them a promise. I, I'm a, I believe in being a man of my word. And so here we are in August, three weeks away, $55,000 short. How are we going to complete this project? And we have no, we, we're at the end. There's no more money. There's, we, we, we've exhausted all of our funds that we had. And so supernaturally, as me and my wife began to pray, we saw the Lord begin to open up a door. And the Lord began to release. We had one individual write a $30,000 check. Come on, that was in the house. And not only that, we had other people in the house that begin to come in and say, look, Apostle, I'll put $5,000 on it. I'll put another $5,000 on it. Me and my wife, we put another $5,000 on it. Next thing you know, we had $60,000 and we had enough to finish the renovation project. When I counted all up, we spent over $149,000 cash on the project. The church that seems small, the church that seems like there's young, the church where the leaders are young, we came together and we sold a, over $149,000 cash toward the project. The Lord says just as he did it for Dominion City, he said, so will he do it for this house. He said, get ready for supernatural funding. Get ready for kingdom benefactors. Get ready for checks being wrote. Get ready for people to sow mega seed in this house. Come on, I need all the ushers and musicians to help me land this plane in Memphis tonight. If you believe me, I want you to lift up your hands and open up your mouth and say about the land this plane on tonight. Hallelujah. From the Bible says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and we shall call him wonderful we shall call him counselor we shall call him mighty god we shall call him prince of peace from the bible says for whosoever for whosoever for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved for how can they call on him if they not believe? How can they hear unless they have a preacher? Do I have a church in here? And how can they preach except they be sent? For how beautiful are the feet of those who preach who preach, who preach the gospel of good news. I wish I had a church in Memphis tonight that will help me plow for God. Highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name with every name. Of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Open up your mouth that true generation tonight and give God a hand clap of praise. If you believe it, throw your head back. And shout glory. Hallelujah. We descended some more. We're almost to the runway. Here we go. And the Lord told me to tell this house and live this tonight. But the Bible says that the word Isaac means life. 
master and the Lord said many of you had laughed in a while you've been depressed but you had laughed in a while you've been down but you had laughed in a while you've been grieving but you had laughing it out weeping I wish I had a church in here weeping may you do it for a night but John said John comes in the morning you believe God for joy throw your head back and help me preach and shout joy This is what the Lord told me to tell this house, and I'm getting out of here. He said to tell you, you've been a laughing stock of your city. Some of you've been a laughing stock of your family. People laughed at you. They said you would never get out. They never said you would never break poverty. They said you will forever stay in bondage. They said you will never get married. They said you will never see kingdom. But the Lord told me to tell this house you will have the last laugh. They talked about you, but TG go have the last laugh. They dismissed you, but TG go have the last laugh. They said you will never make it, but you. Lay hands on yourself and say, I'm going to laugh. The last laugh. Open up your mouth and give God a crazy praise. If you believe in Memphis, that you're going to have the last laugh. Now listen, listen. I got to get out of here. I gotta close. I gotta land the plane officially. And we gotta let you go. But I grew up Baptist. And how I close is I got to land it on a cross called Calvary. That there was a savior, and his name was Jesus. They laughed at him, they beat him, they spit on him, they mocked him and said here he is your king of kings and your king of the jews they put crowns of thorns on his head and they laughed they helped him they kicked him and he had to have help to carry the cross on the hill called calvary as he was on the cross he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the Bible says they had to put them, oh, help me preach it here. They had to put them in a buried man. They had to put them in a bald man's tomb. And the Bible says that he had to stay there all night, Friday night. He had to stay there all Saturday morning. He had to stay there all Saturday night. But I need you to grab your neighbor by the hand tonight and say, neighbor, my Jesus got the last laugh for he got up with all power in his hands. Sell yes! Sell yes! If you believe you're getting up tonight, if you believe you got the last laugh, if you believe your enemy's going to have to watch you bless, they're going to have to watch you prosper, if you believe you're going to have the last laugh, open up your mouth and give God a praise. I'm going to pivot. We got to pivot. We got to pivot to the promise. We got to pivot and to overflow. We got to pivot and to breakthrough. We got to pivot and to miracles and signs and wonders. We got to pivot. We got to pivot. Now open the 
up your mouth and scream, go crazy this way. She can't be a man of 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 of Jesus we come tonight to seal this victory we come tonight to seal what God is going to do in the realms of the heaven in the realms of the spirit if you believe it, make some noise in this room come on, worship, worship him worship him black right here it's just you the Lord told me he says your season of Lodabar is expired he said to make an announcement tonight that your season of grieving your season of carrying what other people couldn't appreciate is over God says the value on your life is about to immense to a new dimension and he told me to announce over your life tonight that your season of Lodabar is over. It's over. Your season of Lodabar is over. I'm talking about this, this lady right here. I want to make sure I get it right. I'm not, I'm sorry. Yes, you. Yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. I want you to come. I just want you to come. I just want to pray for you real quickly. Hallelujah. Come on. We're getting ready to transition. Come on. Come on. We're getting to pray in the Holy Ghost in this room. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, the Lord says... The value on your life has just went up. And so because the value of your life has just went up, we can no longer tolerate what is beneath what God has called you from. I declare the name of Jesus. The Lord says this is a testament that he sees your tears, that he's heard your cry. You've been pleading to God, God, can you come and find me? The Lord says I sent the apostle to find you tonight.